Here's your screen. Okay. Where's my here? I think that's it. Okay, share screen. And there we go. And there we go. And I'll go to present. Present. Okay. All right, so I think we're all good to go here. Okay, so here's a bit of a presentation on Zoroastrianism. How does this work? Uh, come, oh, okay, there we go. I'm gonna sneeze. Okay, now, <clears throat> now Zoroastrianism is, uh, can you see that here? Let me just, okay, Let go up there. Okay. <clears throat> It's, um, as you can see here, this is an older religion. Uh, again, we're in Iran. Now we're looking at the oldest religion of Iran versus the newer, newest religion of Iran. And now the dates generally historically have been for the founder of Zoroastrianism, from which it gets its name, is Zoroaster, is the Greek uh, name, uh, version of the name, or Zarathustra. And his dates, as you can see here on BCE, uh, 628 to 551 is a traditional date. Now, in more recent times, some uh, academics have been claiming that perhaps this religion goes even older than this, is earlier than this, because of some of the language, it's some ancient uh, terminology that's used. But otherwise, there really is no historical reference to this religion prior to uh, this time period. So, you know, that's up for debate. It's not consensus. This has been always the traditional view, even amongst Zoroastrians, like forever. So is that the dates uh, for this religion go back here to around 600 BC. So now we have very little uh, historical data over the figure of Zoroaster. It's more legend. And the story is, is that he was a priest at the time in ancient Iran or Persia. And What's interesting is that he was a priest of what religion? Well, it seems that some of the religious beliefs and practices of that time in ancient uh, Persia, right, is very similar to what we find in ancient India and the Vedic traditions. And so there's a connection, it seems, between some of those religious beliefs and practices that went into India and then also into Iran came from the Aryans. And that's where the word Iran comes from, is from the word Aryan, the Indo-European people that leaving kind of who knows from Central Asia went down into India, into Iran, and then parts of the Middle East as well, and also into Europe, so that we have some similar language structures. We're all in the same Indo-European family system of language connections there. So it seems that the religious beliefs that uh, Zoroaster would have engaged in as a priest had similar features to um, what we find in ancient India in the Vedic texts and traditions. We find similar terms, practices, and language there. Uh, animal sacrifices were done and the various names of deities, there's some similarities there. Now the story is, is that even though he had been a priest, for whatever reason, around the age of 20, Zoroaster went into the mountains in solitude, sort of on a spiritual quest. And again, was he sort of like in India, a guru going into the forest to meditate, uh, seeking enlightenment? Who knows? But this is the tradition, is that he went on a quest for about 10 years. And during that time, he had some divine visitations. All right, he had some sorts of experiences of encountering these beings. And these beings, you know, we can maybe call them angels if you want, because uh, we have that sort of experience throughout time and space with different cultures and people. And the word angel simply meant a messenger, a spiritual messenger. You can think of it as a spirit guide today, if you like. Uh, but some kind of a, an intelligence uh, appearing, communicating, right, bringing uh, revelations from above of another dimension. And so here, the first being that appears to him was labeled the term as good thought, is sort of the name of this sort of angelic type being, if you like, and that then took him up to heaven where he met the supreme being, the creator of the universe, who here is known as Uhura Mazda, which means the wise Lord. And he was told uh, to go forth and teach people that they should worship just the one God, that there really is only one God. Okay, so we get monotheism here. And, and that people have free will and that they need to consciously and purposely always choose to have good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. 
And this becomes central to the whole ethical system in Zoroastrianism, is making that daily commitment in your prayers that you're committed to good thoughts, what you think, your thoughts are good. And then from that, you always speak good things, you commit to good words, and then good action, good deeds. Okay. And, uh, and it's held that also during this time uh, in the mountains that he also met other various angelic beings, or they become known as sort of like holy spirits of various kinds. So he returns to the people after this period of these visitations and revelations. And, uh, and he calls upon the people to stop the old religion that they were following involving animal sacrifices and worshiping many deities and various deities to worshiping one God and two, he was calling for the elimination of animal sacrifice. Well, for that, he gets persecuted, uh, was very much resented, especially by the religious establishment at the time the story goes and he ends up getting imprisoned. And then through various circumstances that take place, the king's favored horse becomes ill. He is called upon to perhaps heal the horse and he successfully does so. And this then le leads to the conversion of the king where the king now becomes a believer in Zoroaster and supports his religious perspective. Okay. And so he now gains political support for the new religion of Zoroastrianism. And this is how it gets established here. Uh, amongst, oh, and I don't think I mentioned that, uh, the, um, yeah, the Persian Empire. And uh, let me just go back to previous slides. Yeah, so there's nothing else. Here's a, a classic kind of image of Zoroaster. So this is at the time where we have the establishment here of the first and uh, a very powerful Persian Empire, the Achaemenid Empire, and that was established by King Cyrus. And here we've already met him with respect to Judaism, where King Cyrus is the one who allowed, again, they, they overtook the Babylonian Empire, if you remember, and the, under the Babylonians, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, and the, uh, and the Jews were in a state of exile, taken away from Jerusalem and the temple. And as King Cyrus, in establishing the Persian Empire, he now grants the Jews the return to Jerusalem and, to re and gives them money from the royal treasury of the Persians to rebuild the temple. And, uh, and this is one thing that uh, um, the Persian Empire, this first one was very well known for, is being very tolerant, religiously tolerant. And Zoroastrianism was their official state religion. And this is when Zoroastrianism gets established here at the time of the Persian Empire. Okay, and here you can kind of see it was quite large, taking over the whole Middle Eastern region there. Oops. Okay, huh. I never get how this works. Why is it that it doesn't go? I want to go down. No, I don't want that. I want it to go down. Okay, there we go. Okay. Well, then, uh, yes. And I don't have that in there. Did I have that in there? Ah, 3.30. Uh, yes, I didn't mention here. The Persian Empire gets overtaken by the Greeks, the Alexanders. Uh, Alexander the Great, he comes into rule and overthrows the Persian Empire, establishing the Hellenistic or Greek Empire at the time around 3.30 BC. Okay, so that happens. And then Zoroastrianism pretty much gets annihilated. And this is the key thing. A lot of the Zoroastrianism that we have of today actually is representative of a later development, not of this early period. And that's what makes some things a little bit tricky here to know exactly what were the original beliefs of Zoroastrianism in the very beginning uh, of this early time period, because so much of it got destroyed at the time of um, Alexander the Great establishing that, that empire. Oh, here, I'm doing the same thing again. Now why? There we go. Okay. But then, you know, the, the, the Greek Empire gets overthrown by the Roman Empire. And then we have another new empire, oh, the Persian Empire of the Parthians, which I didn't mention, of 224 BC to 226 CE. We have the Parthian Empire, which was more polytheistic than Zoroastrian. Okay, it was sort of more polytheistic and kind of a, 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 a motley assortment of things. 
And then under the Sasanian Empire here that gets established in 226 CE up until 650 is again revives Zoroastrianism. And so here is where the Zoroastri Zoroastrianism we have today, a lot of it gets recovered, but also undergoes through changes in development at this time. Okay, so that a lot of the scriptures, the Avestas, are of this time period and they contain within them some of the older hymns known as the Gathas of the earlier period, but a lot having been lost. Okay, all right, just to again put things in historical perspective. But then what we then have is the rise of Islam, and then under Muslim conquest, the Sasanian Empire is destroyed, and then as a result, Zoroastrianism uh, tends to scatter, the, the believers do. Many seeking refuge in India, where they become known as Parsis, um, and being then a religious minority, were often then uh, very limited, sometimes persecuted or whatever, but they... Uh, uh, many of them leave the Muslim region, as, as you can see here on this map. Uh, the largest majority is over in Mumbai in India today, and with little pockets elsewhere. Okay. And so the population today, they're small. Uh, the Zoroastrians are a very small population, maybe 150,000 at the most, and we'll say about 120 or so, but they're on the decline. It's generally regarded as religion that's dying because a, it's not a missionary religion. They are not out to convert people okay, to the faith, and they encourage marriage within the religion that a Zoroastrian should marry another Zoroastrian. And and so then it just hasn't been expanding. It's been shrinking in time. So it's not uh, expanding in any kind of a way. Okay, so what are some of the teachings here? Well, it's a little bit tough because sometimes it comes across as being dualistic, but yet officially it's monotheistic. It believes there's only one supreme being, one God, the creator, which I mentioned, Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda, as you can see here, that's the earlier name of the very beginnings of Zoroastrianism, but then later under the Sasanian period becomes known as Armazd. So that's more of the term that's used today as Armazd. Now, there's the idea that they're also were created in some way, these twins, the Holy Spirit, and then this evil spirit known as Ariman. Uh, the older name is Angramanyu, and uh, again, in more recent times, Ariman, okay? And, um, and that, again, there's sort of spiritual forces out there, one for the good and one for the evil. And we humans are in the midst of sort of like a bit of a battle between good and evil. And we have the free will to always make a choice of good or evil, okay? And we have that freedom. And so uh, the way of the evil one, the evil spirit, Ahriman, he, is, he wants to destroy God's creation. He's the source of evil, the source of deception and lies. You know, he is the liar, the druj, as opposed to the Holy Spirit that represents truth and righteousness. Okay. So, so here you even find it, say, for example, in the Bible, you know, you know, the reference to the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies. Uh, he seeks to destroy and attacks God's creation. You know, that kind of idea is so prevalent out of the whole Middle East uh, region there in the ancient world that it shows up in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and of course, Zoroastrianism. It's almost, I see it as being sort of a shared cultural pool of ideas that these traditions draw from. It's, I think, extremely difficult to be dogmatic of a definite historical lineage of um, origins and influence. It really is a cultural pool of shared ideas, and each religion works with them in their own unique ways, I, I think is the best way of looking at it. You know, even going way back to, you know, the Sumerians and the Babylonians, etc. Anyways, uh, to continue on here, we have uh, this key idea that there's a battle between good and evil. And so Ahura Mazda, the wise Lord, expresses his will and his actions through the Holy Spirit and six Amesha Spentas. These are other spirits that have various duties and, and obligations. And they're almost like faculties of God in a way. Um, Oh, I've got a list of some of their names. You know, I don't really want to burden you with it, but they're called various things. Um, from righteousness to, I don't even know where my list is here. I've got it somewhere. Uh, anyways, you know, various names, rather abstract kind of 
uh, names. And you can kind of think of them, I would think, you know, when you think of the history of religion, it's sort of like archangels that are sort of the assistance of the divine or through which the divine operates. So, but the key thing here, the concept is, is that this world was created by God or must as a type of void or space, a gulf separating God and the realm of holiness in heaven from the evil one, Ariman, which is all darkness and evil, which is below the earth. So you've got heaven up here, the darkness below the earth here, and earth is in the middle. And it sort of creates a space, a chasm, a void between pure goodness and pure evil. And it's like the battle between good and evil is taking place here on earth with us <laughs> as humans, right? Through the choices that we make. Okay. And uh, yeah, this is the thing. And so we're always called to choose good over evil in whatever happens in life. So the key beliefs, oops, oops, oops. Oh, geez, I hate how this goes. I just wanted to move this a little bit more out of the way here. Okay. And it doesn't move any more out of the way. Okay. Well, you can see that's happening. So we here uh, on earth are a call to always choose good over evil, to choose life and creation over death and destruction, to choose happiness, joy over sorrow. Okay. It's we are to always make these choices. This is what life is all about is us and, and the choices that we make. So this world is all created by God or must as being holy and pure, and specifically the elements that make up this world, the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. They are pure, they are holy, created by God. Ariman, the evil one, he seeks to pollute and corrupt and destroy God's holy creation through disease and death and all manner of evil. Okay, and this is going to become the basis of various rituals. And so you'll see that in a bit here. Now, in the end, the good, that which is good, will be rewarded with immortality, wholeness. And at the day of judgment, we will be brought into heaven, what's called the house of song. Whereas all that which is evil will be punished in what's called the house of the lie. Okay, and, and the way it's presented that at death, all your thoughts, words, and deeds are going to be placed on scales and they're going to be weighed. And depending on which way that scale goes, if it's more good, is heavier, okay, uh, that will determine your destiny, right? Uh, and you've got that image in place. And you also have the image of walking across a bridge and that if your destiny is good and if you've done mostly good in your life, that bridge will get wider and wider and you'll easily get over to quote, heaven, so to speak. And if not, you fall off. If it gets more, if you've been done evil, it gets narrow and narrow and sort of like a tightrope that will be walking on and you'll fall off into the pit of hell, so to speak. Okay. And we've seen that imagery that gets picked up in Islam. It's there in the Quran, uh, but it's very ancient imagery. Even the Egyptians have references like this. We find this in this whole region. All right. Uh, this kind of uh, imagery. So, so that's sort of the idea here. And I'll talk a bit more about all this. There's also a belief that develops here in, in that later period of Zoroastrianism is that there's sickle, like the view of time is not cyclical like in India, but there is an idea of our going towards a process of completion. And that there are four, history is limited. There's a beginning and there's going to be an end. And there are four periods of 3,000 years, each making up a total of 12,000 for this created world. The first two, uh, ages were preparation in the third age. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> excuse me again. Uh, is when Zoroaster came. Okay, in that third uh, period of three thousand years, and then in the fourth period or the last period of three thousand years will come sort of a messianic figure called Sayushant, who will bring good fortune, and he will bring history to an end. And bringing history to an end, that will involve the resurrected of all bodies. So you get here the idea of physical resurrection. Okay, this is something that's picked up in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, right? There'll be a resurrection of the dead, and there'll be this judgment that will take place. And all evil will be thrown into this sea of molten metal. Okay, so hot it melts metal. But there, all evil will be purified. It's a form of purgatory. 
but if it's total evil, total evil will be destroyed. And that which comes through is purified and then will be brought into the house of song, paradise or heaven. Okay. So that's kind of the view of, of time is this sense of judgment and also purification. And then all will be holy once again. And all evil is destroyed. So I'm just going to move this over a little bit. So for practices, what in Zoroastrianism, they have fire temples and a key element always in a fire temple is a sacred fire that's burning here. It represents, it's, a, it's the best symbol to represent the presence of God or Mazda, okay? And it is not to be defiled. It's seen as very holy. And here, similar to Judaism, etc., is the idea that God has no image. You can't make an image of God. God is just like pure light and fire and holy. So fire is the best symbol to represent God. Priests tend to drink uh, some kind of a potion that's sort of like in India, Soma. Here it's called Homa, a type of drink of immortality. And that's where you can kind of see that connection with the Aryan influence, the Vedic influence in ancient India. Uh, you also are to pray five times a day, and here you can kind of see that sort of seems to be the influence from Islam. And uh, but of course, it's a bit different. Uh, you are to wear, and you'll see in one of the videos uh, the white shirt that you would wear. You'll have a sacred cord, and you wrap it around yourself three times as you make the verbal commitment through your prayer that you commit yourself to good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. Okay, that's kind of part of the ritual prayer, and you do that five times a day. Now, what's distinct here is how they deal with the body at death. Um, here to the right, you can see that's a tower of silence, it's called. And so because the elements are pure and holy, you'd, and death is the result and the work of the evil one, because he brings destruction. Death has, comes from the evil one that's out to destroy. And so uh, a dead body is, uh, is a form of, defi it's defiled. It's, it's no longer holy. It's been defiled by death. And so you don't want to put the dead body in the earth because the earth is holy. So there's no burial of the dead. You don't want to cremate the body in fire because fire is holy. Okay. So there's no cremation. Uh, the body can't just be thrown in the ocean or whatever because the water is holy. So instead, they'll put it in these towers of, of silence, these cement type towers, so that the vultures, the birds of prey, will come and eat the flesh. And then the bones that are left will be stored somewhere. Okay, so this is how where they have a distinct way of dealing with um, burial and, and death. Oh, is that it? Let me just see here. Okay, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, so it's pretty brief. And, uh, and so I've got listed here a few videos that goes through some of the beliefs and overview of Zoroastrianism, gives you a bit of a taste of it. You can kind of see some of the things I've talked about. They're really good, so do watch them. And uh, there you go. That's a bit of an introduction to Zoroastrianism.